This episode today is brought to you by Surfshark. Oh yeah. Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, get your Jug of Now merch like this Jug of Now t-shirt or this Jug of Now mug at jugofnow.com. Not selling out if it's your brand. So as you guys know, I'm kind of obsessed with border anomalies. It's one of the reasons why I started this channel. And here's the deal. I believe this is the only place on earth where you can do this. Before we get into it though, let's back up a little bit. We've talked about this topic before, but the world is made up of many time zones. In a perfect ideal situation, each hour of the world's time zone would line up perfectly with 15 degrees longitude apart, which is the distance it takes at the equator for one hour to pass on Earth's axial spin. The problem is most of the land we live on is abstractly shaped and does not geometrically fit well into lines. On top of that, people are in charge, which complicates things even more. Suddenly you have countries like China, which has only one time zone despite spanning a distance of 3,400 miles or 5,500 kilometers. Then you have some countries like India, Iran, Afghanistan, and Myanmar that choose to go by additional half hour time zones, whereas Nepal and one small section of Australia decided to go by a plus 45 minute time zone, which is confusing because the seven sister states of India lie further east of Bangladesh and Bhutan, which lie in the UTC plus six time zone, making them a half hour ahead of them despite being geographically further west, which logically would mean they shouldn't even be that way, but they are. And sometimes these time zones have really weird quirks or you run into a region where multiple time zones collide. For example, crossing over from Afghanistan, which lies in the UTC plus four and a half time zone to China, which is UTC plus eight, gives you the single largest land time zone jump at three and a half hours. The largest time zone jump though would actually be in the international date line in the Pacific, where you would go either an entire day in the past or in the future. And specifically the line islands of Kiribati have the largest jump. Now, although the line islands of Kiribati lie geographically further east than parts of Hawaii, Hawaii and French Polynesia, which both lie in the UTC minus 10 time zone, the line islands lie in the UTC plus 14 time zone, which was actually an invented time zone as the country straddled the international date line. So they had to kind of like make sure that the entire country followed one day so that they wouldn't complicate things on the calendar. We already explained this in the episode. In any case, in some parts of the world, three or more separate time zones collide closely. And if you are fast enough, you might actually be able to cross them in less than a day. And I don't mean like hopping across one time zone boundary multiple times. That's cheating. For example, in Greenland, for some weird reason, the eastern side of the island follows the UTC zero time zone despite being west of the minus one time zone. Yet it borders the rest of Greenland at minus two UTC, except for this small area surrounding Itikotomit. That means if you could sail a boat from these mostly uninhabited fjords to Itikotomit to the rest of Greenland, you could potentially cross three time zones in one day. Just to skip away in Canada, Newfoundland goes by the UTC minus three and a half half time zone, however, just below them, the French overseas territory of St. Pierre and Miquelon goes by UTC minus three. And here's the thing, the moment you leave that island just south into the Atlantic, you immediately hit UTC minus four, again, crossing three time zones. If you're feeling really intrepid, you might be able to cross from India to Nepal, back into India and into Bangladesh, making three time zone switches, or India to Nepal, back to India, to Bhutan, back to India and into Bangladesh, making five time zone switches. However despite looking like a relatively short distance, this trip would actually most likely take a very long time due to the rough terrain of the Himalayas and super wide river estuaries that have limited crossings. There are really no straight roads that go through this path and traffic might be abysmal in certain areas. Plus, unless you are an Indian citizen that takes part in the free trade zone agreement, Bhutan has those heavy restrictions and that daily tariff thing to enter. So it would kind of be like an expensive headache to just quickly go in and out of Bhutan in less than a day. But for the trip that I did that I'm gonna tell you about, you would be crossing time zones at least seven times and in less than two hours. And no cheating going back and forth on the same border. Let me explain. The USA and all its territories straddle 11 time zones. However, the vast majority of the population is situated on four of them in the contiguous 48 states. Now, the lines of the time zones and boundaries are a little choppy, but overall, not too complicated. That is, until you get to the state of Arizona and two Native American reservations. Now, today there are 566 federally recognized tribes and 325 Native American reservations throughout Throughout the country. Although these reservations fall under federal land, each of them has their own distinct culture and system of self-rule. Once you go in there, you are under their jurisdiction. Now, here's the thing. Depending on the time of the year when you arrive, Navajo Nation can actually be an entirely different time from the rest of Arizona and Hopi reservation. For parts of North America, daylight savings time is typically observed starting at 2 a.m. on the second Sunday of March every year. The only state in the USA that does not observe daylight savings time is Arizona. This means there's like a weird complication when it comes 
to time zones, not only in Arizona, but in the Native American reservations that overlap Arizona and New Mexico as well. So I decided to actually check it out for myself. And who better to bring along than Alka from Atlas Sova? Remember the guy from the Netherlands provinces video? Yep, we had planned to do this trip for a long time and finally it was time. Here's a motion graphic to explain. Thank you, Vincent, my other Dutchie. Remember him from the Netherlands episode for making it? Man, for some reason, a lot of Dutch people were involved in this. Anyway, here's the motion graphic. Here's the issue. Arizona falls within Mountain Standard Time, or GMT-7. However, as they do not observe Daylight Savings Time, this means about eight months of the year they do not move forward one hour. This means for eight months of the year, Arizona's non-moving forward Mountain Standard Time is essentially the same as the West Coast's time, as they move forward into Pacific Daylight Time. To make matters even more confusing, Navajo Nation does recognize Daylight Savings Time, so when crossing into Navajo Nation, you would have to jump forward one hour from Arizona. However, in that regard, to make things even more complicated, the Hopi Reservation, which is made up of two parts completely enclaved within Navajo Reservation, is like Arizona and does not recognize Daylight Savings Time. So if you cross into these small little reservation enclaves, you would have to jump back one hour. So this was basically the objective. In late March, we would begin our road trip from California to Arizona. From there, we would drive from Arizona to the 160 highway known as the Navajo Trail into Navajo Nation around Tupa City. When doing so, we would jump forward one hour. Now the interesting thing is that Tupa City is right on the border with Hopi Reservation at the town of Moenkopi. Once you cross that street by the McDonald's, you technically jump back one hour. From there, we would take the 264 Highway, otherwise known as the Code Talker Highway. The name actually switches depending on which reservation you're in, so it would be called either Navajo or Hopi Code Talker Highway. The road enters the smaller Hopi Reservation Enclave. From there, it's only about a 10 mile or 16 kilometer drive until you exit the enclave and arrive back into Navajo Reservation. This means you technically would have to jump forward one hour, but only for like seven miles until you enter the larger Hopi Reservation Enclave and jump back one hour. From there, you are in the larger Hopi Reservation and drive for about 67 miles along the Hopi Code Talker Highway, passing through all the major towns of Hopi Reservation until you reach a strange Navajo enclave within Hopi Reservation at the Navajo town of Jadito, meaning again, you have to jump forward one hour. This entire small enclave is only about six miles long, and then you immediately jump back into Hopi Reservation after a quick five minute drive and then jump back one hour. From there, it's only about a five and a half mile drive in the Hopi enclave until you reach back into Navajo Reservation and jump forward once again, ending all the time zone jumps as the rest of the road lies within Navajo Nation until you hit New Mexico. So yeah, that was the plan. And so with that, Alka came over, I picked him up and we headed out. Okay, so this is US Highway 160. It is actually in between two reservations, Navajo Nation on that side in Tuba City, and on this side, this is Hopi Reservation in Moenkopi, Hopi Land. You can even see the sign right there beneath McDonald's. Now here's the deal. It gets a little interesting because Navajo Nation does recognize daylight savings time. Hopi Reservation in Arizona do not. So once you enter from Arizona to Navajo, you have to switch your time zone to an hour. And then when you go back into Hopi, you have to switch it back. And you have to do this multiple times as you cross each border between each reservation as you drive through this area. <laughs> So our journey had already started the moment we changed time zones when we crossed from Arizona to Navajo Nation. Now we were entering the small Moenkopi enclave of Hopi Reservation within Navajo Nation. The road traversing the entire enclave is only about 10 miles or 16 kilometers long, which meant that for about 8 minutes we had to switch our clocks back one hour. Before we go on with the video, I just want to highly emphasize that upon entering native reservations, you have to be very respectful to the communities and inquire about filming. Navajo Nation tends to be a little bit more lenient, but Hopi Reservation tends to be more strict. We asked some locals in Hopi Reservation what the protocol was, and they directed us to speak to an elder who gave us permission to film, although he himself did not want to be on camera. In the end, when entering, you fall under their jurisdiction. And you can even see right here they have a sign that says you are entering Hopi Reservation. Uh, you are entering the exclusive Hopi Reservation area. Your entrance constitutes consent to the jurisdiction of the Hopi tribe and its courts uh, by order by the Hopi Tribal Council. You have to respect these people, 
If you're gonna come in, you are entering an area that is autonomous in its own way, and they do govern themselves. This applies to all of the native reservations within the USA. Time zone switch number two. We went from Arizona to Navajo, now Navajo to Hopi. So it was six o'clock, but here in Hopi Reservation, it's five o'clock. We just switched for the second time. The Moenkopi Enclave goes through some beautiful isolated shrubland on one side and numerous small canyons that host seasonal riverbeds and washes on the other. No less than 10 minutes later though, you find yourself back into another time jump. Okay, now we are leaving Hopi Reservation and entering Navajo Nation once again. So now we are back in Navajo Nation. From there, you have to drive through a very narrow seven mile wide corridor of Navajo Nation until you get back into the larger Hopi Reservation and change your clock back one more hour. Uh, we're crossing right now. Yep. And there is the mileage thing that shows you the Hopi towns that are coming up. We are now back in Hopi Reservation. Since we arrived in the evening, the day was getting late, so we decided we would book a hotel and spend the night in Hopi Reservation at the town of Second Mesa. The distance from Second Mesa all the way from our initial point in Moenkopi was only about 50 miles or 80 kilometers. So overall, it only took about 40 minutes to drive there. I guess we're getting a hotel in Hopi Reservation. <laughs> I did not expect this, but we're here in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> right now staying at our little hotel room and uh, look right now it is 8 28 a.m. okay hey Siri what time is it in Tuba City Navajo Nation Arizona in Tuba City it's 9 28 a.m. so they are a whole hour ahead of us and then we're about to go into another enclave and another one switching time zones multiple times let's do it So we are right here at the border of Navajo Jadito Enclave, and uh, there's no sign. It's just uh, just a mile marker, 406. Jadito, Navajo Nation Enclave within Hopi, and then right up there is the end of the enclave. We've only been here for like five minutes and we're already almost out. Yeah, we are on the border. Is this the border? This is the border and there is no sign. What if we just left Jadito. We're back in Hopi for like five more minutes and then we're gonna go back into Navajo. One hour, one hour, one hour, one hour. <laughs> Within five minutes, you change a time zone. A five minute stretch of Hopi between Jadito and Navajo Nation. <laughs> just five minutes driving and you gotta switch your hour again. So we have just exited the quick 10 minute drive between the Jadito Navajo Enclave within the Hopi Reservation, within the Navajo Nation. It only took like 10 minutes to drive down that road. We're back into Navajo country, um, or county, but we're back in Navajo Nation. And now we have to switch our clocks again, another hour. Out here, time doesn't exist. It's just, it's just a concept. That's how you go across all these time zones in less than one day. So there you go. Now here's the weird little extra bonus thing that has nothing to do with time zones. After you pass Window Rock, you enter New Mexico. But if you look at the map, you'll see all these strange checkerboard shaped plots of land scattered all over the place. What are they? What are these, what are they called? Well, they are called reservation trust lands. All these Tetris block shaped land demarcations are essentially extraterritorial units of Native American lands intermingled between what is legislatively part of New Mexico and Navajo authority. Long story short, these are essentially plots of land that were acquiesced mostly by Navajo families and were integrated into federally recognized reservation status. It gets so interesting because when you drive these roads, within seconds, you could cross through trust land and switch right back into New Mexico without even knowing it. There are no official markers and you can only depend on Google Maps to properly see which one you are in at the time of passing it. It's, it, it's crazy. So yeah, there you go. Uh, I personally believe I've scouted the world. I don't think there's anywhere else where you can cross seven time zones in less than two hours. And technically, if you're crazy enough, you could 
could take a mini side road in Hopi Reservation, like the 62 Road, cross again into Navajo Nation at the Rocky Ridge Trading Post, and hook back down into Hopi Reservation again, adding two more time zone crossings, totaling up to nine. In fact, you could potentially add several more time zone jumps across multiple road and footpath crossings in the serrated border of Hopi and Navajo Reservation. But yeah, we didn't do that because after you accomplish it like seven times, and half the time there isn't even any road sign indicators, and no one really cares about what you're doing, you just start to kind of feel like, eh, I'm good. But yeah, I mean, just like that video I made about the world's narrowest three country salient that I did last year in Togo, like that border anomaly stuff fascinates me. So it was fun to do this trip. And uh, speaking of borders into new places, yeah, 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 I'm not even gonna try to cheese it up. You already know that I'm transitioning into a sponsorship, but like this actually is applicable to some of the stuff that I've dealt with. Sometimes when I've gone abroad in certain places across the world, there's limited or restricted internet. And oftentimes you cannot even access certain pages or sometimes like when using streaming services, you can't even access certain videos. You've probably even seen it here on YouTube. This video is not available in your country. Or sometimes you have to connect to open public Wi-Fi networks, which can be a breeding ground for cyber criminal activity. People have gotten their social medias and identity stolen by, via cyber attacks this way. Well, two can play at that game. Surfshark is a great VPN you can use to bypass all these annoying complication fanatics. Basically, for those of you that have never used a VPN, once you get in, it encrypts all your information being sent from your device to the internet and swaps the location with a new one, changing your IP address. You can even choose which country you want the IP address to be from. It basically tricks everyone into thinking that you are not you and you are located somewhere else so that all your download history and online activity is not linked to your identity. And if that is something you think you might want to have, feel free to download Surfshark with the code GEONOW in the link below for an extra three months of free service. So it's all good. So yeah, don't surf with sharks in the water. Why don't you hire one to protect you? Surfshark, get it today. Thank you, Surfshark. Really appreciate you guys sponsoring Geography Now. So that's about it. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. It was really fun to do. Really cool road trip. Thank you, Alka from Atlas Over for being a part of it. Hope you guys have a good one. Stay cool, stay tuned.